This time on Datasheet Deep Dive, we're going to get our orc on and talk about one of the new super cool data sheets for orcs coming out of the Imperial Armor Compendium. This is the Kill Tank. What's up, folks? Welcome back to Tactical Tournament. My name is Trevi, and we're going to dive back into the new 9th edition Imperial Armor Compendium to talk about one of the data sheets that got the biggest glow up. This is the Orc Kill Tank and maybe the single most powerful tank vehicle in the entire game. This thing is incredible. I'm so excited to talk about it. As we do every time on Data Sheet Deep Dive, I'm going to be doing an overview of this unit's data sheet. I'm going to talk about the unit attributes, some ways you can use it on the table and fit it into your orc lists. I'm going to talk about some synergies you can use with the orc codex and some clan specific synergies with each of the sub factions in the orc codex. I'm also going to do a mathematical comparison between the two main guns you can fit into the kill tank before rendering a final verdict, where we answer the question, should you put a kill tank or many kill tanks? Maybe all of the kill tanks in your orc list. Before we get into the video, I just want to throw a quick reminder down. I'm sure everyone's heard this before, but it's the YouTube talk segment where I tell everyone to like and subscribe. Do that stuff. It's great. Comment down below if you like the video or if, if you are an orc player and you disagree with everything that I say in this video, please let me know. I really appreciate the feedback and I hope everyone speaks their minds to the greatest verbosity they can manage. Anyway, let's talk about this kill tank. This data sheet is an absolute doozy, and it is a beautiful construction of pure orky goodness. Coming in at 275 points, the kill tank is a lord of war choice for an orc army. This means that there's only two detachments that you're going to be able to bring it in legally. That is the super heavy detachment and the super heavy auxiliary detachment. And I'll talk about the difference between those two later on in the video. But the stat line you get for those 275 points is a thing of beauty. It comes in at a pretty abysmal weapon skill of four. It's not unheard of for orcs, but it's not particularly great. A lot of their stuff hits on threes, and a lot of their melee-oriented vehicles hit on twos. So this four plus is a little bit of a shocker. It comes in at the standard orc ballistic skill of five plus, which is firing indiscriminately here. Nobody's really taking time to aim the big guns on this thing. Big ol' strength of eight, importantly, a big toughness of eight as well, with a boatload of wounds behind it that would make any Imperial Knight proud. 24 wounds at its top profile, and starting at eight attacks with a three plus armor save. Now, it degrades relatively heavily, but with a starting pool of 24 wounds, you do have to lose 12 wounds before it gets there. It drops three inches of movement, one point of strength, and two attacks. So fortunately, like most orc vehicles, its ranged attack profile is not affected at all. However, it will degrade pretty steeply in melee. Interestingly as well, like a lot of these big chunky vehicles, uh, the kill tank itself is about 12 inches long and drops to six inches at its bottom bracket in its movement category, which means you can potentially wrap the kill tank and lock it into melee. And if you're positioned well enough, it probably won't even be able to emergency disembark, which is pretty funny as soon as you start degrading it. So if you are playing a kill tank in your army, just make sure you don't get it stuck in too deep. Or maybe you do and you just shoot people. I don't know. Maybe you're fine with it. Orcs like to be in melee. The tank comes stocked with a couple weapons. It has a Scorcha and a big twin big shooter built in. It also has a special melee profile called the Reinforced Ram, which hits for plus one strength, minus one AP for three flat damage. That means it's coming in at strength nine on its top profile, which is significant. That's, uh, that's going to leave a mark when it hits you. Unfortunately, only a four plus weapon skill and... Only minus one AP means you're not really converting many of these very highly. When you do, it's pretty good for three flat damage, but you can't expect a ton of melee damage to come out of this tank. The big headliner on its damage output is its selection of ranged attacks, and obviously the two big guns that it can fit on top. The less expensive option is the Gigashuda, which comes in at a 48 inch range, 30 attacks, big three zero, strength six, AP two, for one damage. So this is sort of an, uh, an onslaught Gatling cannon, heavy onslaught Gatling cannon style profile. Big thing to note, however, is that both of the main guns on the kill tank get plus one to hit if you are within half range. So you are incentivized to ram this giant tank directly into your opponent's face. And if that Giga Shooter is at 24 inch range, it's going to be hitting your opponent on fours instead of fives. And again, that does not degrade when it takes damage. Four plus ballistic skill. I don't think I have to tell you if you're an orc player. 
relatively rare in Orcs, especially for a non-Gretchen vehicle, so that's very exciting. It gets even more exciting when you equip the more expensive weapon to it, the Bursta Cannon. It does come in at a slightly lower range, it's a 36 inch range, but that lower range is because this is essentially the most souped up version of a Demolisher Cannon you can imagine. Three D6 shots with a Blast Profile, Strength 10, AP3 for three flat damage. Now the big downside of that Blast Profile, and as players are sort of coming to learn is that Blast is a little bit more of a debuff than it is a benefit. There's not a, a ton of large units out on the table that the Blast is really going to help you with, especially with a single 3d6 shot. You're not going to benefit from shooting six model units almost at all, or literally at all, because you, you can't roll below three on three dice. That's, that's how math works. And outside of, ironically, like other orcs, there's not a lot of giant units of, you know, 30 models or whatever that you'd really want to hit with those, like, max 18 shots. That said, it is strength 10, AP3 for 3 damage. So you are going to wallop any heavily armored targets with this. Again, just like the Giga Shoot, it gets plus 1 to hit while it's at half range, so 18 inch range. The big downside of Blast, obviously, is that it cannot fire in melee. So while you do want to get your kill tank stuck in to start using that melee profile, it does have to be able to pull back out of combat to fire its gun. Obviously, just like the Giga Shooter, it also adds plus one to hit, so if you're within 18 inches this time, it's going to be hitting on fours instead of fives. Good stuff! The other weapons aren't much to talk about. Scorcha, Big Shooter, they appear all over the Orc Codex. They're nice to have, but they don't do a ton of additional damage. Now, the abilities that this thing has are pretty phenomenal as well. It's just it's just a whole bunch of gold on this data sheet, to be honest. We got the Daka Daka Daka, so it's uh, exploding sixes in the shooting phase. The six gets you an additional shot. It also just natively repairs d3 wound and it's tough to say with 24 wounds even something as terrifying as eradicators are gonna have a hard time killing this thing in a single round of shooting which means it's gonna make use of that repair pretty consistently over the course of the game it does blow up for a lot of six inches for d6 and especially if you're ramming it into your opponent's face when it blows up in their face that's a lot of mortal wounds that you get to spread across their army plus the fact that this is again like 12 inches long so the radius of the explosion is actually huge when you consider the size of the physical model. Further impacting the survivability, we have the ramshackle rule. This one appears on a lot of orc vehicles, and hilariously, while it sounds like it would be a detriment to be a ramshackle vehicle, it actually makes you harder to kill. One in six attacks against you is gonna be one damage instead of whatever the attack rolled. That's awesome against fusion, against high volume multi-damage shooting. If you're hit, getting hit with auto cannons, a bunch of two damage weapons, you know, stuff like that, a lot of those are gonna be reduced down to one and just makes this profile just so annoyingly difficult to chew through. With that, on top of its high toughness value, on top of its enormous number of wounds, on top of some of the sub-faction abilities that we're gonna be able to stack on it, it's just, it's just obnoxious to try to kill this thing. Last but certainly not least, it has the ram ability, which means on a two plus it deals D3 mortal wounds when it charges, which uh, you can combo with some other stuff in the Orc Codex to deal a, a lot of mortal wounds throughout the course of the round, which is, uh, it's pretty funny. Interestingly, it also has a very small transport capacity. It can carry 12 models. This means that you can use it to ferry objective secured models up the table if you want to. You can also put characters inside it to protect it with custom force fields or other abilities like that. It's definitely not primarily a transport, but it is actually very nice in the Orc Codex specifically to have that ability tacked on the end. Lastly, talking about its keywords, it's a vehicle, it's a transport, it's a kill tank. That all makes sense. The big one is Titanic. What that lets this thing do is fall back and shoot which means that even though it's equipped that burst of cannon, if it gets stuck in a melee or if it gets charged, it doesn't have to worry about using big guns never tire to fire while it's, you know, using its ram and using a melee profile. It can just pull back out of combat. It cannot charge innately after it falls back, but it can just shoot whatever it was stuck in with with its gun just fine. I should note as well, the large wound count is a little bit of a detriment on top of that. Anything 18 wounds or above does not benefit from dense cover and also does not benefit from the obscuring keyword. So while things may be obscured from you in some situations, they would be able to see you through obscuring terrain as long as they can draw a true line of sight. This is a really big downside for a lot of Titanic units and that style of unit, but the kill tank actually makes up for it a little bit. Just being so efficiently difficult to kill, 275 points for basically just a knight is a pretty good bargain on the defensive profile. It's also relatively quick, so it can move up to or through obscuring terrain to get its own line of sight if it really needs to. And honestly, with its sort of incredible defensive stat line, the downsides of those 18 plus wounds don't really come into play quite as much as they would for a lot of other units. It being a vehicle does have some detriments as well. Some abilities like Haywire can affect it and be able to punch through that defensive profile. On top of that, it doesn't go through breachable terrain, so terrain is a a big issue for the kill tank. It is 
super duper fast and it doesn't want to get up into your opponent's face. But unlike a lot of other orc vehicles that essentially only do their damage while they're right up close to your opponent, the kill tank still has a very reasonable range band. It's shooting at 18 to 24 inches. And in 9th edition 40k, that's like all of the objectives on the table. This thing just moves to the center and it can threaten with its big, huge, enormous swath of firepower every single objective. And there's nothing your opponent can do about it. And it's just going to blow a bunch of people up. That's what it's here for. We're just going to, we're going to shoot this big gun. We're going to kill everybody. So with that overview out of the way, let's talk about some of the highlights of this data sheet. Obviously, the kill tank is a big, giant, resilient chunk that you're going to put onto the table. And your opponent's going to have to chew through it or get killed by its guns. And that's the question it asks your opponent. It's, it's got a lot of really decent shots at a pretty good ballistic skill for orcs. It's also relatively quick, it's difficult to kill, and especially for its point cost, you're only spending about 12 points a wound on its base loadout, which is really efficient for a lot of these Toughness 8 vehicles. It has a mediocre melee profile, it's not, you know, great, especially in the Orc Codex where you can get some absolutely phenomenal melee options. Uh, but it's good that it has it because it does allow the tank to operate in multiple phases. And especially if it's got its Giga Shooter loadout, it's not really worried about being engaged because it's just still going to shoot you. It can fall back and shoot. It can, you know, make use of all of its profiles all the time and just continue to deal damage in multiple phases as the turn goes on. The Titanic keyword also helps it out here because it can fall back and shoot if it really needs to, which means that it's never really sort of locked up and not doing anything like some vehicles can be. You know, if you wrap a kill tank, it's just going to shoot you, and then it's going to run over some of your guys, and then also, like, you're probably next to, like, 40 orc boys, and they're going to charge you. So it's not it's not going to go well for you. Now, the way I see it, there's two ways you can include kill tanks in your army. And actually, like, literally, there are two ways you can include them in your army. You can take a super heavy auxiliary detachment or a super heavy detachment. The difference is that the super heavy auxiliary detachment never benefits from any detachment abilities, which means the kill tank, despite having a clan keyword, does not benefit from a chapter tech. The upside is that you're only required to fill it with one super heavy vehicle. So if you want to include a single kill tank option in your army, this is the way to do it. It loses some of its efficiency. It still retains its clan keyword, so you can benefit with it with stratagems and abilities and psychic powers and stuff like that, but it doesn't actually get the chapter tactic itself. The other thing you can do is take the full super heavy detachment, which requires you to take a full three Lords of War in it, but retains the chapter tactic. So if you want to lean a really hard into this archetype, you can do that and you're going to be, ben be benefited from it with some slightly more effective kill tanks. Now, what are some of the abilities that we can use on these things once we fit them into our army? There's some synergies in the, in the core or codex, a lot of which I think are pretty straightforward. We got more DECA. That means additional shots from DECA, DECA, DECA on fives and sixes instead of just sixes. Also, you automatically hit on sixes. So even if you're engaged in melee with somebody who's minus one to hit, you're always going to hit on fives regardless. Very important, especially for a unit like this that makes a whole boatload of attacks. Ramming speed, super important for vehicles. Adds an additional dice to your charge roll and... You get to deal additional mortal wounds when you make contact. That's really cool because that also triggers the ram ability as well. So you're going to be potentially doing 2d3 mortal wounds as soon as you hit something. Then you could use unstoppable momentum after you kill them with those mortal wounds to keep going with the kill tank and just ram directly into your opponent's face. That's a lot of CP. Unstoppable momentum, very expensive. Since you can still activate the kill tank and move and fight if there's any enemy models in the unit that you charged remaining. But if you do really need to get its melee profile stuck in, that's one way you can do that. There's also a couple sort of weird little synergies with it. The custom force field I mentioned earlier, you can put a big mech with a custom force field in the vehicle, and that gives it a 5 plus invulnerable save. Very cool. Very expensive, though. An invulnerable save is amazing, especially on the number of wounds this thing has. Just makes it very difficult to kill with dedicated anti-tank weapons, but... Uh, but for like the 75 points that it, it costs to, to put that guy in. There's also a couple other weird sort of tiny interactions. You can give it plus one attack with Warpath if you really want to. You can also put it in a Teleporta because it's only 15 power level, not 20. I mean, this thing's going to get screened out. It's, like, it's enormous. Like, it's not going to do anything. You might as well just put it on the table and make your opponent shoot at it to start with. But that is something you could potentially do if you really want to. Now, let's get into some really interesting territory. Let's talk about some clan-specific synergies. Starting with Bad Moons. This is an awesome sub faction to put these kill tanks in. And if you are building a full super heavy detachment of all three kill tanks, I think this is a really good candidate. Bad Moons give you rear all ones to hit with your range attacks. Phenomenal. For the number of attacks these kill tanks are making, especially if you're bringing the full three of them, 
If you all have all Giga Shooters on them, you're rolling 90 dice, which means that on average, every turn, you're going to be re-rolling 15 of those dice, plus the re-rolls on all their other little guns as well. Excellent. Super good sub-faction ability. You also have the Bad Moon's specific Psychic Power Gleaming Gear to give them a 2 plus armor save. There is a caveat to this, though, which is that you then also need to have a Bad Moon's Weird Boy in your list who needs to be supported by Bad Moon's boys to buff his cast rolls, since that is a relatively difficult power to cast. And that means, like, you're you're all in on the Bad Moon's, and Bad Moon's isn't quite the most optimal clan pick for the remainder of your boys that are in your list. So you're sort of leaning pretty heavily into the Bad Moon's side of the faction, even though uh, that may actually hurt your list in the long run. Evil Sons, another awesome pick for these guys. Makes a lot of sense. They're all about speed. They're all about big vehicles. They're all about reenacting Mad Max in the grim darkness of the 41st millennium. And uh, this big kill tank is perfect for it. We got extra speed with the chapter tactic. We got fall back and charge with the speed freak warlord trait. That means it, that means this thing can operate as normal when it falls back. It falls back, shoots because of titanic, charges because of warlord trait. If you want it even faster, you can put a character inside it with Resmeca's red armor for an additional point of speed. And if it gets stuck in or if your opponent charges it and doesn't kill it, which is very possible, it will potentially deal additional mortal wounds back to their army. Hilarious. Last but certainly not least, Visions in the Smoke gives it full rerolls to hit with all of those shooty attacks on its big burst of cannon or as a giga shooter. Those are high value attacks. There's a billion of them. Full rerolls on this guy. Phenomenal. That's great. I mean, if you're bringing a big vehicle unit in an Evil Suns list, like you're going to be building it around Visions in the Smoke, I assume. And I think this is a good candidate if you're bringing a single kill tank, since the rest of your army can be Evil Suns. Evil Suns boys are great. They get the additional range to charge in. The Evil Suns bikers are pretty okay. And you then get to benefit that weird boy to visions in the smoke your one kill tank and give you all those full rerolls phenomenal if you have multiple kill tanks i mean you can only put the visions on one of them so it's not quite as effective but they're all faster so uh there is a little bit of synergy there death skulls i think the last one that's really important to mention you get a single hit reroll and a single wound reroll there's no variable damage on any of these things so the damage reroll doesn't really do anything the six plus invulnerable save is great since it doesn't have an invulnerable save nately you can improve its ap especially on the giga shooter that's important with uh, maniacal seizure even though uh, as an offensive power that one's not particularly great. The Wrecker's Stratagem also helps this thing when it's shooting against enemy vehicles so it can kill other big Titanic stuff very efficiently. The Deskal's Relic also can help sort of repair it. Unfortunately, you cannot repair it with a mech. The Repair Relic helps it kind of a little bit. You can't both repair this with a mech and with Grot Riggers, the uh, ability that it has to heal D3 wounds, um, but at least the Relic repairs for a flat 3 instead of a D3, so it's a little bit more efficient. Lastly, the fact that all infantry in a Death Skulls detachment gets objective secured is actually a pretty big deal, especially for these kill tanks, since despite the fact that they're enormous and have a billion wounds and are hard to kill, when you're sitting on an objective, there are only one model, and one enemy troop model that has objective secured can, can run in and grab an objective out from under them, but... Because everything in a Death Skulls army, essentially all of your infantry, uh, is obsec, you do have... There are a lot more opportunities for you to protect those objectives alongside your kill tank, which is helpful. Snake Bites have a little bit of synergy. A 6 plus damage ignore is really good, especially on a large wound pool like this. A wound pool that's going to be healing itself and reducing damage with Ramshackle. That's all great. The Monster Hunter strat helps its anti-tank, again, just like Wrecker's if it needs to hit something else very large, which a lot of times it will be doing, especially with the burst of cannon profile. And last, but definitely, definitely least, if you take it in Goths, you can take Mech Boss Buzz Gob and repair it for a flat four wounds instead of any of the other repairs. It's the best repair that orcs have, but uh, unfortunately, none of his other abilities affect them. I think that we would have a discussion here if his plus one to hit ability, Buzz Gob's Dreadheads, worked on the kill tank but unfortunately it's just uh stuff with stompy feet that isn't a stomp it's very narrow unfortunately in its application so now moving on let's talk about a comparison between the two weapon stat lines here which of these two weapon options you're probably going to be want to affix to the front of your kill tank we have the burst of cannon and we have the giga shooter which one's good where and like I do in many of these data sheet deep dive videos, I'm going to be comparing these two mathematically against a lot of common stat lines that we find in Warhammer 40k. Those are Guardsman Equivalents, which are Toughness 3 with a 5 plus save, Marine Equivalents, 
Two wounds, toughness four, with a three plus save. Vehicle equivalents, three plus save also, but toughness seven. And we're just going to count how much damage we can do with these big guns. Last, but certainly not least, knight equivalents, which are toughness eight, three plus armor, five plus invulnerable save. Now, in all of these, I did include all of the weapons affixed to the kill tank. So that includes the Scorcha as well as the twin big shooter up on top. And I assumed that the kill tank was in its optimal firing position, which means that the main gun got plus one to hit. And obviously the Scorcher was also in range, which is sometimes a little bit tough. That thing is only range eight. But given that you're going to be playing this thing aggressively, I think it's going to be able to shoot that pretty often. And looking at the Bursta Cannon to start with, that actually that, those additional weapons help it a lot, making it much more efficient against small units especially this guardsman equivalent stat line of toughness three with a five plus save one wound kills 7.2 of those guys versus marine equivalents it starts falling down a little bit doing about half as much damage which makes a ton of sense at 3.8 kills every time it goes to shoot however the big power of the Bursta Cannon is its immense damage against armored targets. And we can see that here versus vehicles doing almost 10 damage per shot. Without any buffs whatsoever, this gun almost just saws a rhino in half. And obviously, you're going to be dacking it. You're going to be rerolling its hits. You got the Bad Moons in there. You got Evil Suns in there. You're going to be buffing its accuracy. This thing should crack a Lehman Russ equivalent tank in half every time it goes to shoot. Sick. Things drop off a little bit against the knight equivalent because of the invulnerable save, blocking a couple of those hits, doing uh, only about eight wounds per shot, but still very reasonable, especially since at that amazing strength value of 10, you're going to be wounding any of those things on threes, regardless of their toughness for the most part. I should also mention that I think this Bursta Cannon does have a little bit of additional upside now that a lot of Space Marine lists and even lists like Harlequins are focusing on three wound models. So this Bursta Cannon coming in at a flat three damage means that it's going to be very efficient against a lot of that stuff. You're shooting at Blade Guard Veterans, you're shooting at Eradicators, you know, Heavy Intercessors, Toughness 5 especially, so without Transhuman, you're wounding everything in that faction on twos, essentially, and then immediately killing them every time they fail a save. Now, the downside is that it does cost 50 points above what the Giga Shooter costs, so it's going to be a little bit less efficient in terms of that, but if you're aiming it at hard targets, it's going to make up for those extra 50 points very quickly. Moving over to the Giga Shooter, we can see it is almost twice as good against Guardsman Equivalents, which I think is to be expected, killing about 15 of those every time it shoots. Versus MEQs, it is also more effective with the higher volume of attacks punching through the two wounds pretty quickly. It falls down quite a bit against Vehicle and Knight Equivalents. Now, interestingly, because its AP value is not very high on the Giga Shooter, the 5 plus invulnerable save of the knight actually doesn't matter, and also the toughness value doesn't matter. So you're going to be winning everything with, with everything on 5s. It's going to be a, a 3 plus or a 5 plus save for the most part. So it's damage versus regular toughness 7 vehicles and a toughness 8 knight is going to be exactly the same at about 4.2 wounds. A far cry from the 10 wounds that we're expecting out of the burst of cannon. Now, I should mention also the Giga Shooter just being a high volume attack means that if you get any of those reroll abilities, they're going to compound. And if you get, you know, a good turn of rolling with Daka Daka Daka, that could potentially explode the potential damage output that you have pretty significantly, especially something like Visions of the Smoke, where you are getting a full reroll into a 6 plus with then also a full reroll means that the chances you explode your hits on those sixes is much greater than you would normally expect. So in the comparison between the two, I mean, which one comes out ahead? And I think it's a little self-explanatory. If you're shooting at infantry, you want the Giga Shooter. I did mention Harlequins before, uh, taking a lot of three wound models that the Bursta would be good against. On the flip side, having a high volume of attacks to get through invulnerable saves is also good. So I do think that that is actually a pretty good call in the meta right now. Anyway, Strength 6 is a good break point right now. There's a lot of Toughness 3 armies between Harlequins and Sisters being very popular. And there's a lot of Toughness 5 armies between all of these, you know, Gravis Armored Space Marines being very popular popular as well. And Strength 6 gets essentially a plus one to wound on, on both of those. You're going to be wounding Toughness 3 on 2s. You're going to be wounding Toughness 5 on 3s versus a, a Strength 5 weapon, which is a lot of these high volume weapons. As the 2021 meta develops as well, I actually think one damage weapons are going to go up in value since in just a couple weeks, we're looking at the release of the Death Guard Codex, which has almost universal damage reduction in it. And uh, damage one cannot be re reduced. So it's not going to matter. You know, this thing isn't an auto cannon equivalent. You're not paying points or paying shots for an extra damage on them like a you would be in a heavy bolter it's just shooting a billion damage one shots and it's gonna start chewing through those death guard models uh you know with their newly revamped disgustingly resilient and i think it's gonna be very good so the giga shooter has a lot going for it i do think the burst of cannon 
looks a little bit more impressive, especially against vehicles. There aren't a lot of vehicles that we're shooting at right now, but if you are fighting against, you know, things like Blade Guard veterans, big heavy space marine infantry, the burst of cannon is going to be phenomenal against that stuff. So, I mean, I can't, it's hard to call like one weapon over another. They're good in different metas. And as we do more of these statistical comparisons, I like that a lot of these weapon options, there's not one clear answer to them. Depending on what you're fighting and depending on what meta you're in, you can sort of massage it if you're bringing a full super heavy detachment of these kill tanks in your army. You can bring two of a Giga Shooter and one Bursta or two Burstas and one Giga Shooter, depending on the meta that you're expecting to play into. So the flexibility of the kill tank is also another point in its favor. And speaking of points in the kill tank's favor, let's talk about a final verdict. Should you put a kill tank in your list and or should you put a billion kill tanks in your list? And the answer is absolutely yes. This data sheet is phenomenal. There's a little bit of a sticker shock with the initial price tag between 275 and 325 points is a lot for a model in 9th edition 40k. These are single model units, you know, they're just a big target on the table, they can be seen through everything, you can be shot through everything, they're not going to put a lot of model count onto an objective to hold it against your enemy, but like, man, you're playing orcs, dude, you could put these three things in your list, you have 1300 points for the rest of your list to fill with orc boys, to absolutely swamp objectives with. You can take some punchy characters to go around the flanks and sort of clear these things out from fighting. And the kill tanks add a resilience and an incredible base of shooting that orc armies just have not had for a really long time. There's some other data sheets in the Imperial Armor Compendium for Orcs that we're going to be talking about in Datasheet Deep Dive over the next couple days, and I'm super excited to cover them. But oh boy, is the kill tank obnoxious to deal with. It's an incredible addition to the Orc staple, and... Uh, I'm super impressed by this data sheet. Before we wrap up the video, editing Trevi is here because just after I finished recording and editing this entire video, we played the T5S2 Season 2 Pod 24 Finals over from the Tactical Tortoise Discord, which you can join in the link in the description. And we played it on twitch.tv slash Tactical Tortoise TV. The finals table featuring Haliverath. Big shout out to him playing triple kill tanks. And we got to see all of the cool combos or most of the cool combos, I should say, that we talk about in this video live working out. It was sick. If you haven't checked us out on Twitch, go over there. We play 40K online like constantly all the time. We have competitive games and casual games and just games and games and so many games. And also you can see cool combos like this triple kill tanks combo, which serendipitously we had on stream just before this video came out. So super cool. The VOD should be up when this video goes live. So if you're watching this video after its release date, it should be up there for a couple weeks. Other than that, I'll try to put a link in the description down below so it will be remembered for all eternity as a super cool game of 40K. Anyway, this topic was chosen by the patrons over at patreon.com slash tactical tortoise. If you want to choose data sheets to review in future episodes of data sheet deep dive, you can just go over there. Not only do you get to make suggestions for future deep dives, but you also get early access to T5S2 events. You get some exclusive content. I put my bloopers in all these and uh, I mean, I think they're funny, but also I'm a narcissist, so I don't know how well that translates. But also, we just have a sweet community. We got a patrons-only Discord channel in the Discord server, and it's just uh, it's just fun. So I highly recommend it, and I really appreciate it if you do decide to join. Stay tuned for more Orc content on Data Sheet Deep Dive and on the channel in general coming relatively soon. And remember to keep it classy, folks, and have happy wargaming. <laughs>